back in some of those most famous plays in Alabama history. Certainly, uh, George Teague running down Lamar Thomas is one of those that many of us have uh, hanging on our living room wall. Uh, George Teague, welcome back to Tuscaloosa. I hope you're doing well, sir. I am doing good. Uh, thank you very much. I was very glad to be on with you today. No doubt. Let, let me just ask you if if I say 25, 25th anniversary, does that make you feel a little old? Oh, my gosh. What do you mean? And Especially since I'm always uh, reliving the national championship from back then and people were bringing it up and even I have to catch myself when I say, you know, that, that happened 25 years ago. Everybody's kind of like, what? And, <laughs> you know, and to hear our, our youth say, man, I, you know, that was the year I was born. Yeah, it, it ages me a little bit. I'm just curious because I know you can give us an update because I know you're coaching uh, high school football there in the state of Texas. Uh, do you go back and relive some of those moments with your players and talk about uh, maybe that uh, that whipping that you gave the Miami Hurricanes or, or with your team? <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I am coaching, uh, being a high school a head football coach at John Paul II High School in Plano, Texas. It's in Dallas. Um you know, any time I've taken a job, most of the time the students have already known because with the internet and Google and everything else, most of them see that play uh, very quickly. Uh, um, but it's funny that you ask that because we I do sometimes use it as a, you know, when we talk about effort plays um, and never giving up, it's one of those things that I can rely on and be able to say, hey, I've been in your shoes and I've been tired and been in big games and all that kind of stuff. But even when you think you're beat, you need to you need to finish the play because you never know what's going to happen. I'm I'm just curious uh, when you look at Coach Stallings, and we love to feature Coach Stallings, and and we've certainly been thinking and praying for him as far as his health last couple of weeks. Uh, but we feature him every Wednesday right here on our program. Uh, can you give us an inside story of, of of Coach Stallings and some of the things that maybe he said to you that you still automatically think of when you think about Coach Stallings? Yeah, yeah. so there's uh, a lot, but I'm, I'm going to give you one that sticks out to me in regards to um, making it to the National Football League uh, because, you know, it was one day in practice, um, you know, how uh, rough he is and how hard he is and that kind of stuff. And I was, uh, I guess I was having a difficult day in practice working on my, Man to man stuff, and he he kind of calls time out in practice and walks out to the middle of the defensive back drill and and proceeds to get on me and you know hits me with an Teague, um, I don't know what you want to do at Alabama, but if you want to go to pros, look here, son. You want to be in? The, do you want to go to pros? And I say yes, sir. I, I'd like to be able to do that. And he says, well, you're gonna have to do it like this. And he actually got in the drill. Uh, Bent his old little knees over in his back and all that kind of stuff, and got up in the face of the wide receiver, and uh, proceeded to show me exactly how it needed to be um, done. So he just wasn't about the uh, talking part of it. He he decided, you know, well I'll get in here and and show you exactly what to do, and uh, that meant a lot. Um, and it's actually um, allowed me to to mold myself after him a little bit about. You know, sometimes you just got to show the kids on, on how to do it as well. So I'm I'm very thankful for all his leadership that he gave me, uh, in particular, about, you know, stuff on and off the field. Let me walk you into that season, but let's not go to the Miami game just yet. Let me just talk about the season that was developing. At what point did you realize that this team was special and that you guys had the makings of just being a team that could, could – you know, possibly go and you know win an SEC title and then eventually a national title. What what point did you realize that that team was so great? Um, you know, I think it, and it's going to sound weird because a lot of times you think it would happen beforehand. Um, just because in my junior year when we ended up being eleven one that year, we lost to Florida. We got a tails handed to us and it kind of makes you think of, um, about it, give you a good self-check. But my senior year, after we went in and were able to beat Mississippi State, I think uh, we knew at that point that we were going to be a, 
pretty stinking good um, football team. And we had to tough it out and battle a lot of people um, every single week, it seemed like. Um, you know, it, it just, we knew no one was believing in us. We felt like it was just uh, us against the world kind of thing, Tuscaloosa against the world, all the way up until after we won the national championship. So, um, you know, we had some pretty big moments as a team where we actually talked about, okay, how, how are we going to get past uh, the naysayers and how are we just going to um, continue to, you know, stay strong together as a team. As we continue right now, we're talking to George Teague. When you go back to 1992, he was certainly a big part of that, went on to play a lot of gears there in the pros as uh, he's coaching there in Plano, Texas. Uh, George, let me go back to that Miami game. Did, did you guys walk into that game believing that you were the better team, that you did not believe the the hype around Miami? I mean, what was it that sort of motivated you guys to to maybe get past all the negative naysayers that didn't think Alabama could do it? Um, I think that we – we I won't say that we actually felt like we were a better football team than them. I think – we knew that we were more um, sound, if that's the word I could use. We were more disciplined. Yeah, that's probably even a better word um, than them, and we felt like we could use that to our edge. Of course, they had a lot of talent on that team. I mean, a lot of first-round guys and that kind of stuff. Um, but we weren't as flashy. We weren't didn't have the old party town of the Miami mystique. We didn't have all the celebrities behind us and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we didn't necessarily know that we were, you know, a more athletic team, uh, but we surely felt like we were just as fast as them. We were just as, uh, or more disciplined than them. And that if we just applied ourselves like we've been doing all year long, that we could, um, overcome it. So we were a little bit pissed off. I'm sorry if I'm yeah. able to say this. No, you're fine. You know. Say it all. Yeah. I, I agree <laughs> with you. I, I hear it quite um, often. Yeah, we were quite um, pissed off that no one wanted to give us a chance um, at all, you know. And um, and the more they kept egging it on and talking more noise, there's so many competitors on our team. I mean, true competitors that nobody was going to back down um, at all. So they kind of lit a, an extra fire underneath us, um, you know, that kind of exploded in their face on the – on that day uh, in New Orleans. George, let me let me ask you, because this is kind of unique, and I'm going to tell you what the fans here in Tuscaloosa say. We, we did a uh, your favorite championship. I mean, only in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, could you start 16 weeks prior to college football and count it down week by week by week. But we asked the fans, what was the favorite national title? And many of them go back to 1992 because it was post-Coach Bryant, and it proved that Alabama could win a championship without Coach Bryant 1992. It, it, it just seems to be that that, that championship game and, and that season is the favorite among Alabama fans, even with a recent success. Everybody went back to 1992. The majority of people did uh, that went back to 1992. It was just a very special uh, memory for most of us that pulled for the Crimson Tide. Yeah, and I think uh, in some aspects, I think it was, you know, Added to a defining moment for the program. Of course, Alabama football had always been good before we got there. Um, and I think now when you look at present-day stuff, I think it's kind of expected that we're going to uh, win championships, you know, with the great job that Saban is doing. Um, but I think that year and those middle years there that I don't – I really don't know if really people thought we really were that good or that we could actually advance you know, with the way the systems were made and, you know, how you got to the um, championship game that we could actually be that, that good. So I think that's why um, it's remembered the way that it was because, we, you know, we're always a good football team but not necessarily the one to go win the national championship. We can win the SEC or something of that nature but not bring it all the way home. And so, um, you know, having the struggles that we had sometimes on offense, um, just speaking of just that one year or two years there, that you know people thought, well, they it, does defense really bring championships or not? <laughs> um, and so um, we go into that season and actually 
win some close ball games, some tight ball games. Um, and have to play some really good football. And then just the climax of beating Miami, you know, January 1, 1993. Well, sorry, beating Florida December 5. <laughs> sure. You know, in the first SEC game, it, that, I mean, that, that's just another piece to it. Now we got to play a 13th game? Oh, my gosh. You know, it was just. And if you guys um, would have lost that, uh, we may have never heard about the SEC championship more. They, they Co- Coach Stallings and many others might have dismantled that game. <laughs> I know, and trust me. That, you talk about the amount of level of stress on the players too. I mean, the coaches were stressed, but oh my gosh, we were stressed. Like, oh no, Spurrier and these guys, and this high flying passing attack, man. Thank you, Antonio Langham, uh, for <laughs> grabbing that interception and taking it to the house. Because uh, you know that was a dog fight we were trying to get out of to get to the national championship. Um, so I'm glad it was a first, uh, and that we're ever forever put into that. But man, sure made it hard on us. I've got a few more questions, and I don't want to run you late for any meetings. So uh, if you need to go and, and meet with your football team, uh, but I'd like to ask two or three more questions if possible. Yeah, no problem. All right, let me ask you: What was the look on Gino Toretta's face? in 1992 when you guys confused him and Bill Oliver and the mastermind that he set up there to sort of get the Heisman Trophy winner confused? Oh, well, I'll give you two words. Um, one is confusion because he hadn't seen anything like it before. Um, so, you know, you kind of know when you look around and you're looking at the quarterback and they're trying to figure out what you're doing. He's very confused. Um, and then that confusion turned into fear. Um, and at that point, we knew we had them. It didn't matter about anybody else. We knew the quarterback was confused and scared. Um, so, oh my gosh, that's when the you know attack dogs come out hmm. at that point. Um, and so when he, I don't know if you remember the play. I don't remember exactly what court it was, but he dropped back and fell down on his own. <laughs> oh my gosh, that that was that was it. We knew we had him then. Yeah, and, and you know he's a he's a class guy. We we featured him here, and he kept saying uh, Copeland and Curry, man. I mean, they had me looking up at the dome. He said I looked more at the top of the dome than I did on the side of the dome. He said I was on my backside more because of Copeland and Curry. Yes, man. It was so. It, I mean, he had a tremendous career. He's a great guy. Um, you know, he's a great football player. I mean, just being in the system that he's in, and you know, getting to the National Football League and all that kind of stuff. But, um. You know, it's just, I can say, it's just fun on the other side when you know you got guys trying to guess. Because typically we're always trying to figure out what the offense is doing and how they're going to attack us. And to have Bill Oliver, you know, put this in uh, and keep it secret for a month, (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, and not let it get out on what we're going to do was just, uh, it was great. It was fun. Final couple of questions here. From a coaching perspective, how has Coach Saban been able to be this successful? You say from a coaching perspective? Yeah, yeah. For just for the way that you see it. I mean, you understand the game from a player perspective, coaching perspective. I'm just curious at how you see and, and how Nick Saban has been able to build, uh, you know, one of the greatest dynasties in the history of college football. Well, first, and I was thinking of this just – personally on my own, especially being a coach now. You know what? One thing I like about Saban, outside of the X's and O's, is that one thing he said to me when I visited with him when he first took the job, um, and he was talking about where the program was going to go and what it was going to do, is he talked about making sure we had kids, athletes, players, that were going to understand the Alabama way and know that they're coming here to get a great education and to graduate regardless of what happens with their football career. I knew that was that was extremely important to a lot of people, right? And I think what he's done is being able to recruit the highest level players who also combine that philosophy that, hey, education is important. We're going to give you the best opportunity to get to the league if you want to get there. But if not, you got to have something else to fall back on. So I think that's an easy selling point. Then when you get to the coaching standpoint, he's a master motivator. Um, I think he knows how to hit the buttons of the coaches, whether that means getting in your face, saying something, or you know, giving you something 
positive or some kind of critique to say, no, we need to do this or that. Same way with the guys. Hey, how do you be great men? Character, play with class, win with class, and, uh, you know, um, how are you going to represent us after you leave this university? So I think that's it. Final question. Mika Fitzpatrick. I, I just see him, you know, when you talk about great defensive backs at the University of Alabama, I mean, you could name, you know, 20, 25, 30. Certainly uh, you and many others of your teammates were in that conversation. I think Mika Fitzpatrick's also writing his name in that book. He played uh, all the secondary positions. He played linebacker special teams uh, on Saturday just alone. Uh, your thoughts about Mika Fitzpatrick? What do you see in this young man? I think he's outstanding. And come on, you're going to give me a question and you're going to tell me all the answers. Uh, My apologies. I think he's, <laughs> he's great because he can do everything. You know, and I, I look at um, the best guys in the league. Most of them can play corner and safety, um, especially with his um, size. You know, that's the man, you know, I. 200 pounds, you know, tall, over six foot tall, and be able to run, hit you, cover you. Um, those are, are very rare um, breeds. Um, and so when you're smart and you can play inside, outside, middle of the field, tackle, um, you know, it, it's just, you got to have that. And he's still young. Um, so, you know, um, I'm looking forward to seeing how how he continues throughout the the year, but he's going to have a great NFL career, um, you know, just because he can he can do all those things, and people will be able to pick and choose, you know, is it safety, is it corner, slot guy, um, you know, where does he fit in someone else's program once he gets above and beyond. Hey George, thank you again for what you mean to the Alabama family. Your name comes up quite often here on the program, and certainly that 1992 team. Enjoy the moment, and we'll salute that team. And hopefully, we do a nice tribute uh, throughout the week as we honor uh, that 1992 team. It was a special one for Alabama fans, and I appreciate you making a conversation here in Tuscaloosa. Thank you. Well, I thank you, and I look forward to being back this weekend. And uh, hopefully, I'll see a lot of happy faces before and after the game on Saturday.